I'm here with Jacob Hacker, who is the director of the Institute for Social and Policy Studies at Yale University. He's the author of American Amnesia, How the War on Government Has Led Us to Forget What Made America Prosper. Well, thanks for having me, Isaiah. It seems to me, and I want to run this past you, uh, the old attack line about tax and spend liberalism, which has been used as a cudgel against uh, particularly Democratic candidates, certainly hasn't been keeping people from voting for Bernie Sanders in large numbers in this presidential race as a person who is very unapologetic about taxing and spending uh, and investing in, in, in a large and active government. Or for that matter, even Hillary Clinton, who has her own expansive uh, spending agenda. And it even hasn't worked for to the benefit of mainstream Republican Party presidential candidates, uh, most of whom have dropped out of the race. Uh, and so I'm wondering, uh, does that mean that the power of tax and spend as an attack line has lost its power and we can move on to really talking about what government ought to be doing? Well, I wish that were the case. I do think that we're in a period where people are concerned about the state of the economy and their own and their own future much more than they're concerned about uh, the the size of government. But it's also true that there's enormous distrust of government. It's hard to see a Donald Trump arising except in a context in which people feel like government isn't working well and they need to put a strong man who you know who who isn't with the program, the Washington program, in charge. You know, and it's interesting what you say about Sanders because um, I think that's absolutely right. I think he's uh, staked out a very ambitious agenda. He's put put forth a set of proposals that would involve a, a fairly substantial increase, not just in the size of government, but in its role. And that hasn't been seen as a kind of toxic uh, uh, position, nor has Hillary Clinton's. I think what's difficult is both candidates are speaking, obviously, to one segment of the electorate. And so thinking about how does that message resonate more broadly? And second, I think they are both working in a context in which they're really having a hard time overcoming people's uh, distrust of government. So, for example, Sanders couples his proposals with, with a pretty substantial critique of how government has been captured over the last generation. And, and one wonders, and I think this is behind some of the concern about his capacity to actually carry out his agenda, how he's going to wrest control of government from these special interests and get it working again in the ways that both he and Clinton suggested should. So I think we're moving to a point where we actually could have a real debate over the role of government, but I don't think we should fool ourselves into believing that we're quite there yet. I think it's still a pretty harsh climate, and I wrote the book with Paul Pearson because we really wanted to make the case on so many grounds, beyond just the ones that liberals already know, for why you need an act of government to secure prosperity. Well, you, you, you went to what I wanted to get at, which is sort of dis, distrust of the capacity of government to do good things. At the same time that I think there is a hunger that's also demonstrated in the polls that, you know, you don't, if, you, if you're a candidate who says, well, we're going to cut back on Social Security and Medicare, that's, that's, a, that's a toxic position. You don't get to advance on that. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of other things that, that if you say that you're against this particular government function, uh, chances are you're not going to win uh, a majority of the vote. So how does this tension play out in your mind? Well, I think it, there's two things. One is that people are willing to endorse very specific government programs like Social Security, which is wildly popular. And, you know, Donald Trump has exposed what I think everyone who studied this issue knows, which is that most, even most Republicans love Social Security, right? It's not a winning political uh, position to go after the most popular and successful program in American uh, economic history. Um, so I think, though, that when you start to talk more generally about government, then you start to get into this sort of toxic stew of distrust and dissatisfaction. Some of it actually a good deal of it justified by how poorly our government has worked over the last few years as it's been basically gridlocked and unable to move forward on infrastructure and research and development investment uh, on raising the gas tax which is sort of obvious way in which we could deal with our infrastructure crisis uh, you know on our, on our on budget issues on jobs on so just 
this sense that government is just so unable to act is is I think the ultimate problem because a lot of the a lot of the policies we need today involve long term investments. They involve uh, making the kinds of investments we made after World War II when we effectively created the kind of knowledge economy that we're now uh, that we're now living in. And it's going to require to do that. It's going to require that we have an active partnership between government and business leaders. And, and so right now, we both have very little trust in government in a sense that it doesn't work. And, uh, and a kind of, uh, you know, uh, government business relations, a business community that's so hostile um, to even fairly modest um, government measures. And so in the book, we talk about what made possible the mixed economy of, you know, a strong government thumb working with the nimble fingers of the market in the 20th, you know, in the mid 20th century. But we really believe that this is going to be possible in the 21st century, but it's not going to be an easy road. And it's, and I think that the starting point will be reminding people of the specific things that they value in government. But the longer term priority has to be to get people to understand that there is a whole host of things beyond just taxes and spending and beyond just uh, income redistribution, as important as those are, that are necessary for us to be a prosperous, uh, long-lived, uh, healthy, um, educated society. Such as the kinds of things like in, uh, the, the infrastructure investment that we've been so lagging behind on, uh, the research uh, uh, stuff that we used to do robustly in yeah. uh, the 20th century, but has fallen off as a percentage of our total economy and our total government spending in the last few years. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, I just finished a piece with Paul on Andy Grove, the former CEO of Intel, who passed away last week. You know, and Andy Grove is an interesting case because he really experienced that robust investment uh, directly during his career. And just as Steve Jobs did, he used some of the investment in technology and ideas that had been a product of, of public action um, and used them to develop a successful private company. And so there really was a synergy in, in Silicon Valley between these public investments and this private entrepreneurship. To the, you know, Andy Grove went to the uh, City College of New York and then UC Berkeley. He started out at Fairchild Semiconductors, which was a, a, a company that basically was selling to the Department of Defense and NASA. And, and so we forget this chapter at our peril because if you think about what's the economy of the future going to look like, a successful economy, it's going to be one where we invest in green, green energy technology. It's one in which we have that we win the race for, for technological supremacy, that we're producing the ideas and the products that the rest of the world uh, wants to use. And, and that's all going to require that we embrace and work with, um, with this, uh, with this far-sighted government role. And so, you know, it's a twofold problem. We have to rebuild the capacity uh, in government and faith in that capacity. And second of all, we have to use, start using that government effectively. And those two things are intertwined. But I'm pretty, I'm pretty optimistic. I mean, I think you've seen a lot of pessimism about American economic growth and future. But if you look out there, you see an enormous uh, reservoir of of uh, innovation ready to be tapped if we can start to get our policies in line. In fact, the, we're doing, the fact that we're doing so well, despite the fact that we haven't you know, been investing in infrastructure, that we haven't been uh, getting more kids through college in the way that we used to, it suggests that we have an enormous amount of money on the table if we start to use government effectively. I've got one more question for you. Um, you're probably aware of the grassroots mobilization that's been around the Progressive Caucus People's Budget. Uh, the, your view of the importance of having this progressive alternative vision of government that invests heavily in infrastructure, education, public health, research, and what that can do to inform and guide the 2016 political discussion and beyond. I think it's very important, and, and I think there are two messages that come out of the progressive budget um, that I really miss by a lot of commentators today who are talking about how we have this horrible austerity problem and that we have to cut back even further. The first is that we can actually increase investment if we don't cut taxes further on the wealthy, which all the Republican candidates, including Donald Trump, have argued for. I mean, I think this is what really was the big issue with Paul Ryan, is that, 
you know, he talked a lot about how we had to get, you know, our budget in line. But then the centerpiece of his proposals has always been these huge tax cuts that actually make the deficit worse. The second thing that we learned from the progressive budget is something that we, a point that Paul Pearson and I make in American Amnesia over and over again, that if we got tougher with what we call the modern robber barons, with the healthcare and finance and energy industries, we could actually achieve substantial savings without cutting necessary spending. So we could invest in infrastructure. It's just false to think that, oh, if we, if we don't you know, s slash um, infrastructure spending and R&D investment, we're not going to have a budget that, you know, that's in line in the future. No. If you deal with health care costs, for example, then our long-term budget uh, picture looks pretty rosy. And so that's why we're optimistic about the future. It's that these are solvable problems, but our political system isn't living up to the, to the, to the promise of our society. And you know, that may not be an optimistic vision in one sense, because it means we've got a lot, a lot of work to do to get our government in line. But I'm encouraged by the kind of mobilization that's happening. And I'm happy that the progressive budget is out there, because it's really a reminder of how far from a sensible debate about these issues we've gotten, and how we, we can't treat government as a bad word. And maybe today we're having a little bit more of an opening to have that conversation that we should have had 20 or 30 years ago, when we were trashing government and abandoning all of these long-term investments that are essential to our prosperity. So if the book can start that conversation or help contribute to it, Paul and I will be happy. And, and I appreciate the chance to come and talk with, with you about it today. Thank you. The book is American Amnesia, How the War on Government Has Led Us to Forget What Made America Prosper. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Isaiah.